The ocean is a vast and mysterious place, covering over 70% of the Earth's surface. It's home to countless species of marine life and plays a crucial role in regulating our planet's climate and weather patterns. But when it comes to human activity, the ocean is often seen as a resource to be exploited for its wealth of minerals, oil and natural gas. In this video, we'll explore the complex laws and regulations governing the oceans from the ownership of its waters to the exploitation of its riches. The Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, is an international treaty that governs the use and management of the world's oceans. While the Law of the Sea recognizes the concept of national sovereignty over coastal waters, it also establishes the principle that the high seas, or areas beyond national jurisdiction, are a shared resource that should be managed for the benefit of all countries. Approximately 64% of the world's ocean is classified as high seas or international waters, meaning that it is not under the jurisdiction of any one nation. The remaining 36% of the ocean is within the jurisdiction of coastal states, including territorial waters and exclusive economic zones. Internal waters, also known as inland waters, are the waters located on the landward side of the baseline. The coastal state has complete control and authority over its internal waters, just as it would with any other part of its land territory. This means that foreign vessels are generally only allowed to enter these waters with the permission of the coastal state and in cases of distress. Right of Innocent Passage, which allows foreign vessels to navigate through a country's territorial waters without engaging in any harmful activities, does not apply to internal waters. Examples of internal waters include rivers, canals and lakes, which are typically under the exclusive jurisdiction of the coastal state. The baseline of a state is the line along the coast or the outermost points of the coastal features from which the seaward limits of a state's maritime jurisdiction are measured. In other words, it is the point on shore from which a state's territorial sea, contiguous zone and exclusive economic zone are measured. It serves as the starting point for measuring the distance of a state's maritime zones and is usually defined by the low water mark along the coast or the outermost point of the coastal features. Every country that has a coast has the right to claim a certain area of the ocean that extends 12 nautical miles from its baseline. This area is called the territorial sea and the country that owns it has full control over it including the airspace above it and the ocean floor below it. Foreign ships are allowed to pass through this area, but they must do so without causing any harm to the coastal state or its interests. This is also known as the right of innocent passage, and the ships must follow the laws and the regulations set by the coastal state, which must be in accordance with the international law. A contiguous zone is the maritime zone adjacent to the coastal state's territorial sea that extends up to 24 nautical miles from its baseline. The purpose of this zone is to enable a coastal state to enforce certain laws and regulations beyond its territorial sea. Within the contiguous zone, a coastal state has the authority to prevent and punish infringement of its customs, fiscal, immigration and sanitary laws and regulations within its territory or territorial sea. The contiguous zone serves to enhance a state's law enforcement capabilities and prevent criminals from evading justice by fleeing the territorial sea. Coastal states have the right to claim an exclusive economic zone adjacent to their territorial sea, which extends up to 200 nautical miles from their baseline or until a maritime boundary with another coastal state. Within this zone, the coastal state has specific rights and duties, including sovereign rights for exploring, exploiting, conserving and managing natural resources of the seabed and subsoil, as well as the waters above it and other economic activities like energy production. Basically put, a state has the exclusive right to use this area for the exploitation of all living and non-living resources. Living would be things like fish as well as animals living on the sea floor. And by the way, living animals on the sea floor is rather a controversial topic, but more on that later. And non-living would be any resource taken from the ground such as gas and oil. The continental shelf of a coastal state is comprised of the subsoil of the submarine areas and seabed that extend beyond its territorial sea to a distance of 200 nautical miles, in some cases even up to 350 nautical miles from its baseline. 
The portion of a coastal state's continental shelf, which lies within the 200 nautical miles, is called the exclusive economic zone. The portion of a coastal state's continental shelf that lies beyond that 200 nautical mile limit is often called the extended continental shelf. Within this extended continental shelf, other rules apply. The natural resources of the extended continental shelf consist of the mineral and non-living resources of the seabed and subsoil together with living organisms belonging to the sedentary species. That is to say, organisms which at the harvestable stage either are immobile on or under the seabed or are unable to move except in constant physical contact with the seabed or subsoil. This is cause for controversy all over the world. Some countries consider things like sea cucumbers, snails, crabs and lobsters to be living resources which would put these resources in international jurisdiction, while other countries consider them rather only living to some extent, by which I mean not living at all. Some states believe that because they live on or under the seabed, that they belong to the seabed and that they should have exclusive exploitation rights as they are part of their extended continental shelf. The non-living resources are pretty straightforward, basically anything which does not live, so we have mineral, oil, gas, etc. The high seas, also known as international waters, refer to the remaining parts of the ocean that are not under the jurisdiction of any particular state. These areas are outside the national boundaries and sovereignty of any state and are thus considered to be part of the global commons. The high seas are generally open for use by all countries for navigation, fishing, scientific research and other peaceful purposes. Deep sea mining is the process of extracting valuable minerals and other resources from the ocean floor at depths of up to several thousand meters. The most commonly targeted minerals are polymetallic nodules, cobalt-rich crusts, seafloor massive sulfides and manganese nodules which contain high concentrations of minerals such as copper, cobalt, nickel and other rare earth elements. These are used in a range of high-tech applications such as batteries and electric vehicles. Under UNCLOS, coastal states have jurisdiction over the resources within their exclusive economic zone, while resources in areas beyond national jurisdiction, including the deep sea, are the common heritage of mankind and are to be managed by the International Seabed Authority. The ISA is responsible for issuing licenses for deep sea mining and ensuring that mining activities are conducted in an environmentally sustainable and socially responsible manner. While there is potential for deep sea mining to generate significant economic benefits, there are also concerns about the environmental and social impacts of the activity, as well as questions about who should benefit from the resources that are extracted. There are a number of problems associated with the deep sea mining. One concern is the potential environmental impacts of mining operations, which can include disturbances to the seafloor and damage to marine ecosystems. The deep sea is a unique and fragile environment, and there is a risk that mining activities could have unintended and long-lasting consequences. Another concern is the fair distribution of benefits. There is a risk that some countries and companies may benefit more than others from deep sea mining, particularly if licensing decisions are not transparent and fair. The ISA has established a heritage fund to provide benefits to developing countries that lack the resources to undertake deep sea mining themselves, but there are concerns that the distribution of these benefits may not be equitable. To address these concerns, it is important that the licensing process of the deep sea mining is transparent, fair and inclusive of all stakeholders, including affected communities. It is also important that environmental and social standards are upheld and that the mining operations are conducted in a responsible and sustainable manner. However, there are concerns that the regulation and oversight of deep sea mining activities may not always be effective and that there may be gaps in monitoring and enforcement of regulations. In conclusion, the ocean is a vital resource that provides countless benefits to the planet and its inhabitants. However, the complex laws and regulations governing the ocean highlight the tension between the need for conservation and the desire for economic exploitation. While the law of the sea recognizes the concept of national sovereignty over coastal waters, it also establishes the principle that the high seas or areas beyond national jurisdiction are a shared resource that should be managed for the benefit of all countries. 
The various maritime zones, from territorial waters to exclusive economic zones, each have their own regulations and restrictions that aim to balance the interests of coastal states and the international community. As we continue to explore and exploit the ocean's riches, it's important to remember the importance of sustainable management and conservation efforts to ensure that the future generations can also benefit from the ocean's riches.